Scott, tell us about your bathroom renovation. It is hell on wheels. Uh, not having a functional bathroom on your sleeping floor when you have a toddler is a challenge, uh, to say the least. You'll be happy to know um, that until about an hour ago, I was sitting on my toilet here in my office because it was relocated here by the renovators in front of my desk as if it were the chair to the desk. <laughs> I did ask them to move it, <laughs> so it, it is relocated. And then they very kindly like took a l- long lunch break uh, so I could actually record this thing, which is great. Um, but they're actually doing great work. It's like amazing how quickly they can just freaking wreck a room uh, when they're d- doing the demo phase. It is, it's fun. But living through renovations just stinks. Like, and this is the first of what we hope to be a long string of renovations. And we're just we're not looking forward to it. Have you have you either of you lived through renovations before? Have you done this? I know you're a homeowner, Molly. We have done some very I hesitate to call them renovations because in both cases they were like work that needed to be done because something had gone wrong. Um oh. and so uh in that sense, like yes, they were contractors and yes. They were doing work, and yes, it took longer, and weird things happen. Um, but it was it was a uh, water man. It was uh, in both Oof. cases a leaky shower, and then um, a leaky dishwasher that did some damage to our kitchen floor. And so, uh, so yes, I have lived through that experience. I mean, I haven't lived through res- renovations, but I feel like I've always, because all the apartments that I've always lived in, it feels like the people around me are renovating. And so there's just constantly construction. So I feel your pain, Scott. It's not pleasant. And I'll say, Scott, like the in-home renovations don't get you like bonus toddler entertainment. So right. like we've had a lot of work done by various utilities outside our house in the past several years, new gas lines, new water lines, all kinds of stuff. And there, at least you can, it's loud, but you can use it to your advantage. You can direct the toddler to pay attention to the excavator or the cherry picker oh, or like what that. have you. And you don't even get that from the in-home renovations. Not not quite. Although also my toddler has taken to kind of just wandering over to the open doorway and like pulling the plastic out and just staring at it. And it completely, again, we're just through the demo phase. So like no floors, no walls, like exposed brick and joists and pipes everywhere. It looks and he just says, it's bootyful. This is bootyful. <laughs> and I'm just like, this explains so much about the state of your room. If, if this is your aesthetic, if this is what you're going for, this explains how you treat my house and my possessions. That, that's perfect. <gasps> Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rational Security. I am your regular co-host, Scott R. Anderson, here with... No, no one, no other co-hosts of a regular variety on this particular episode, but I am thrilled to be here in the Jungle Studio for a very bizarro world, inverted version of Rational Security, where there is but one host by someone who very well might as well be a co-host at this point, uh, because she's been on the show, I think, longer and perhaps as frequently as I have. Of course, I'm talking about Lawfare Senior Editor and Brookings Senior Fellow, Molly Reynolds. Molly, thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, it's good to be back for the second week in a row. I, I did not even give you double header credits. Hopefully, uh, hopefully listeners can handle um, this much Congress content, but uh, but here we are. Well, I mean, next week you get a triple crown. That's why you got to come back for it. I did wear a crown on my third episode. I think it's only fair <laughs> that you do the same. It's a privilege we all earned. And we are thrilled to be joined with someone who might be up for her triple crown or quadruple count, crown this time, one of our more recent favorite guests. Of course, we're talking about Lawfare Legal Fellow, Anna Bauer. Anna, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, I think this is my fourth time on, uh, but... There you go. Uh, yeah. I don't know what comes after the triple crown. Quadruple cupcake? I don't know exactly. What we need but... is like a coffee punch card. And then you when go. you fill up the card, what I don't know what you get. That's on you, regular co-host Scott R. Anderson. <laughs> but, you can just um, say no once, and then you then you have to start all over again and come on 10 times. I think that's how we're going to play this. Um, well, I am thrilled, regardless, to have you guys here. for what We're going to go ahead and call the Sestar edition. That is Ratsack Backwards, uh, in honor of this very upside-down, topsy-turvy episode of Rational Security. Because in spite of having a little bit of a different career and a little bit of a different format, we have some big national security news. Uh, and some sultry uh, kind of 90s television drama uh, national security news as well coming in um, that we're going to be digging into in this episode. And I'm thrilled to have you guys here to help me do that. For our three topics, our first one is two houses divided against themselves. 
The fate of key national security legislation, including the Ukraine supplemental and border legislation, is increasingly coming down to the increasingly dysfunctional dynamics within and between the two chambers of Congress. What does this tell us about the way this institution has evolved and is operating in this very consequential year? Topic two, Fanny, be tender with my love. Any Bee Gees fans? Not any Bee Gees? That, that is a deep cut into the Bee Gees. There is a song called Fanny Be Tender With My Love. If you heard it, I think you would recognize it. It's got a familiar sort of riff, but that's okay. Uh, but I'm thrilled. That, is a, that this- is a deep cut, Scott. I, might, I have like, had this in the back of my mind for weeks since I was like, oh, our, the first time we should talk usual, about this. usual like elder millennial cut. I don't even know where. Yeah, where I don't even is. think that are the Bee Gees. The Bee Gees though aren't el- no. elder millennial. No, 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 oh, no, 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 no. They are. They are decidedly. Say, decidedly we, make, we do some deep boomer. cuts sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I think this is more. I grew up with this with my parents playing it mm. in the car on road trips, sort of situation. But I'll take it. You know, when I start quoting Boston and Steve Miller Band, it'll be right in the same genre. But regardless. For this week, a story, of course, is that in recent weeks, Fulton County Prosecutor Fannie Willis's case against former President Trump and his associates has been endangered by rumors that she is engaged in a longstanding affair with subordinate prosecutor Nathan Wade and that she extended the investigation into former President Trump to secure more salary for him over the course of his time in her office. But is this story smoke or is it fire? What should we make of it? And what will it mean for the prosecution of former President Trump and his associates? And topic three, Carpe Seasum. The Biden administration has officially come out in qualified support of seizing Russia's frozen assets to compensate Ukraine, and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is scheduled to consider authorizing legislation this week. Is this finally a route to accountability for Russia, or do the associated risks outweigh the benefits? For our first topic, I'm going to hand it over to me to get us started. Uh, Because we are circling back for another double dose of a topic we tackled a little bit last week with you, Molly. This is, of course, the affairs going on in Congress, because this is, in a lot of ways, the big national security news happening right now. A lot of what the Biden administration can do, a lot of its policy towards certainly Ukraine, to some extent the border on a number of other issues, Israel, Gaza, substantial parts of it hinge on the ability to get supplemental legislation through at some point in this Congress in one form or another. And we've seen some progress in this direction, as well as some signs that maybe there's not as much progress as some people seem to be indicating this week. I think there's a little more optimism maybe a day or two ago, and now it seems like people are a little more pessimistic again. But it's hard to timestamp the articles and when these journalists talk to their sources to know exactly what the current state of play is. And you made the interesting point, which we want to drill in on today, which is that we're really seeing some really interesting dynamics emerge between the two chambers of Congress, the House and the Senate, uh, and in each chamber, including some ways that the internal operations of those chambers are shifting and kind of affecting the dynamics between them. We touched on this briefly last week, but we thought it was interesting enough to come back and start talking about it a little bit at length. Tell us a little bit about what we're seeing in this dynamic over this real keystone piece of legislation that is really notable as telling us something about how, how Congress is operating these days. Yeah. So I think there's, um, if we want to take this and like zoom out a little bit to um, help us understand some things about how the contemporary Congress operates, I think one thing that I'd note is that, so in the Senate, which is at least at present, still really driving these negotiations over a piece of legislation that would make pretty significant changes to immigration policy, and then would hopefully, by doing that, unlock support for um, additional assistance to Ukraine. Um, Those negotiations in the Senate are really being handled by just three senators. Journalists have have, uh, taken to calling them a trio. So uh, Jim Lankford, who's a Republican from Oklahoma, uh, Chris Murphy, who's a Democrat from Connecticut, and Kirsten Sinema, the Democrat turned independent um, from Arizona. Um, And so when you sort of read about these negotiations, like those are the three players that you hear about. Does it mean something that we're down to a, a gang of three from what like used to be gangs of eight and gangs of 12? I think they've had gangs of 12 before, but like gangs of eight is like the big now security one we always talk about. But now we're down to three. Yeah, that's not good. So the I fact mean, that it's an odd number seems very ominous. I mean, it's just generally interesting that this is another example of where we have this kind of like informal negotiating coalition 
They get referred to sometimes as gangs. No one, uh, I think, has been really referring to the three of them as a gang, more as a, as a trio. Um, but you're right that we have this shorthand for how we talk about these um, these informal negotiating coalitions. And in this case, what's, I think, interesting to me, at least, is that particularly in the case of Lankford and Murphy, neither of them are folks who I, and I think many other folks, like strongly associated with immigration policy before they sort of took charge of these negotiations. Um, and Lankford in the past couple of days has been reported um, as saying that like he hadn't, he didn't ask to do this, that he was sort of drafted into it. Um, I don't know all of the internal workings of the Senate Republican conference. If I did, someone would pay me more money than I get paid to do this job. But it's, so it's interesting that to me, at least that we have these sort of three senators driving these negotiations who aren't folks who have been necessarily historically historically really um, very involved in this policy area. None of them are on the Senate Judiciary Committee, which is if you were sort of more traditionally trying to write a immigration, big immigration reform piece of legislation, that would be the purview of the Judiciary Committee. Um, Dick Durbin, who is um, the chair of the Judiciary Committee, came out this week and said that, you know, if they reach a deal on these on this language, it's not going to go through judiciary. It'll just go directly to the floor. Um, this, again, is like another example of something we see a lot now in congressional policymaking, this idea that we have these negotiations that happen outside the traditional committee structure. They don't get um, talked about in committee. They come, um, they come right to the floor. And so that that's one thing um, sort of within the Senate that I think is um, is quite interesting and worth um, noting. I think it tells us something about kind of the difficulty of trying to solve policy problems um, in, a, in a gridlocked Congress. And then the other thing that I'll note is that this is also an area where we're seeing some pretty significant divisions between the House and Senate Republican conferences. And I think to some degree, within the Senate, the broader Senate Republican Conference itself. So there's there are reported divisions within the Republican Party in Congress over both the Ukraine piece of this. So if we get to a deal on the immigration piece, um, as I said earlier, the hope would be that would unlock additional support for um, aid to, to Ukraine. It's not. It's actually not clear that that is necessarily a cause and effect. Like we, it may be that Murphy and Langford and Cinema get to a deal, even a deal that they could get 60 plus votes for in the Senate, but that in either the Senate or even more likely the House, there just isn't the appetite among Republicans for additional assistance to Ukraine. So Mitch McConnell, Republican leader in the Senate, continues to be certainly within the Republican Party, um, the biggest and most vocal champion of additional assistance for Ukraine. And so he is really, and you sort of, I don't want to say necessarily say it's a sense of desperation, but you've really seen him like turn up the rhetoric on um, like how important it is to do this, how they really need to do it soon because the Ukrainians really need um, all the help they can get as soon as the United States can possibly shovel the money out the door or shovel the money to wherever it shovels it to do that. And so you sort of you see that um, in the in the Republican conference in the Senate. You see, I, I do think, though, there's kind of more of a sense of like actively wanting to do something both for Ukraine and on immigration. And you've also seen some folks in the Senate Republican conference make a, a point and we could debate whether this is right, which is basically that if Democrats are willing to come to the table and off and actually vote for as many concessions as reportedly are being made. This is the best deal that Republicans are going to get on some of these immigration provisions around asylum and parole. And that should President Trump win election again in 2024, Democrats will not come to the table like this with the Republican president in office. And they will not come, um, they will not come to the table uh, like they have um, over the past couple of months. And so there's this question of, you know, if they say, if Republicans walk away from this deal, how much leverage does that give Democrats to say, look, we tried, we actually tried much harder than many of the folks in our own coalition wanted us to try. And it's Republicans who walked away from this. Now, the House, it's just a totally different story. Um, the House, both in terms of where the center of gravity in the conference is on the policy, they, I think the probably the median member of the House Republican Conference wants something much more conservative 
than what is already, again, I want to stress, reportedly, a pretty significant set of possible changes to immigration law. I think the the median House Republican probably wants something even more um, aggressive than what's um, what's on the table. And I think also among House Republicans, there's a little bit more of what we might call wanting the issue, so that they think that kind of the current um, situation involving border crossings and the number of individuals um, seeking entry entry into the United States, that that is, that's useful as a political issue for running against Joe Biden in the fall. Um, And I think that their sort of sense of that and the value of that is different than Senate Republicans. And so that creates this, I think, really difficult set of dynamics, um, especially if you, well, so again, the, the changes we're talking about to immigration law here, I think, would have real genuine big consequences for um, people who are seeking entry into the United States and, frankly, people who are already here. Um, but certainly, if you are a person who cares a lot about trying to secure additional assistance to Ukraine, the fact that these two issues have become, like, pre- it seems to me at least pretty inextricably linked is just, it's a, it's, remains a huge challenge for trying to unlock additional help um, for the Ukrainians. So, like, a consistent theme that has struck me as I have become more of a student of Congress, mostly at your feet over the last five or six years I've been at Brookings and Lawfare. It's music been, to my ears. It's been a wonderful experience. I have become, I think, a junior Congress scout uh, at these days. I think I'm, a, I'm more or less official. It, you know, I've written at least one article that involves a whole lot of congressional procedure. Actually, several articles that involve a lot of congressional procedure. So I've earned my, I've earned a couple badges at this point. Um, the part that's interesting to me that people don't, I think understand how essential it has been to the operation of both chambers, but particularly the House, is party discipline. And we've seen like really interesting things happening happening with party discipline. We kind of on both, it sounds like actually. I have been looking at more of the House, but it sounds like me on the Senate too. Can you break that up a little bit for us and how like illustrate like the role it normally plays, why it's important and What's happening with it here in these cases? Yeah, um, it's a great question, Scott. So I'll say just one thing quickly about the Senate, um, and then I'll talk more about the House because it's actually much more interesting in the House. Um, So in the Senate, I think what we have seen, again, particularly on the Republican side of the aisle um, over the past year or so, is weakening is probably the right word for it, um, of McConnell's kind of hold on the Republican conference. So this acknowledgement that Mitch McConnell, more active acknowledgement that Mitch McConnell is not going to be the Senate Republican leader forever, and that there are issues, and I think assistance to Ukraine is probably number one on this list, where his own kind of personal convictions are not entirely in step with those of many members of his conference. And there's more of a willingness to sort of push back against what he's trying to do. Um, I think there's a really probably best example of this was back in September when we were approaching um, a possible government shutdown. This is the possible government shutdown that immediately preceded the um, overthrow of Kevin McCarthy in the House to sort of orient us towards our possible shutdowns from this year. And there, uh, when the House sent over a temporary spending bill to keep the government open that did not have additional assistance to Ukraine, McConnell, I think, if left to his own devices, would have said, no, we're not taking this. We're going to put Ukraine money in. We're going to send it back to the House. and We're going to try and jam them. Uh, but his conference wasn't with him. Um, they said, no, like we'll take this deal with no additional Ukraine assistance. And that like that's what we should pass and McConnell you know because he is only as powerful as his conference empowers him to be said okay so i think that's that's a sort of interesting dynamic on the senate side on the house side though we have seen basically a collapse of what political scientists would call Republicans um, procedural majority in the House. And so in the House, the way that most significant legislation has generally come to the floor is that first, there's a kind of procedural vote on the on the legislation that sets the terms for debate. Is, you know, are there going to be amendments offered? Um, if there are, here are the ones that are in order. Are we going to waive any of the House's rules to get this bill done? That, that sort of thing. And historically, those votes on those procedural motions have been really strict party line affairs. And there's been a really strong norm that even if 
you as a member of the majority party are going to disagree with the underlying bill, you're going to vote against it. You vote yes on that procedural vote, because if you don't vote yes on it, then your your leader, the Speaker of the House, doesn't have the procedural power he needs to set the House's agenda. And we have seen a faction of House Republicans um, over the past six months or so be willing to just totally throw that norm um, out the window. Um, we saw it happen to McCarthy um, several times before he got overthrown. It happened to Mike Johnson um, a couple of weeks ago. And so that's left Johnson um, in a place where on a lot of matters, uh, he needs to turn to kind of alternative procedure that allows him to circumvent that procedural vote, but where he needs Democratic votes. And so that leaves us in a, a spot where, you know, Republicans, if the kind of most rebellious faction in the House Republican conference are really willing to dig in against something, they they can't even bring messaging bills to the floor. They can't even bring bills that would ultimately, uh, that are ultimately going to die in the Senate anyway, but are important to the, the conference because they want to be able to say, this is our position, or maybe they want to try to put some Democrats in a tough spot. They can't even bring those to the floor if you don't have the support of basically all of the House Republicans to vote yes on that procedural vote to, to bring things to the floor. This is wild. Yeah, I, I actually want to, and I want to turn to ask you a question as a recent law student. This is me getting a little bit esoteric and maybe a little into pedagogy. Where where would you get esoteric if not on rational security? Exactly, exactly. Because uh, you know, I went to law school a long time before Anna did. Sadly, uh, you know, I think a solid decade, maybe a decade and some change. But when I went to law school, I took legislation. I was like very black letter law. I think I took almost every black letter law class, and I got a lot out of them. And I really am shocked now looking back about how much they really, even in law school, treat Congress as such a black box. And all these factors that so clearly enter into what is being agreed to and the purpose behind different things, like just do not register in our conventional doctrines of statutory interpretation and a lot of things that judges apply based off a lot of like fairly facetious assumptions about what Congress is doing and why. Uh, and then on the assumption that Congress somehow our least organized, least responsive body will adapt to the court's expectations because they wish to they wish to make sure that the court applies their laws properly, which Scott, is insane. This is, this is the biggest sign that I have indoctrinated you into a student of the US Congress is that you there have you come go. to realize this defect in your legal education. <laughs> it's really, it's just astounding. It's just astounding. But I want to know, like, in the 10 years I've been gone, have things improved? I know there is like leg reg now, which I think is a brilliant class, which I think, HLS requires all one else to take. And they did while you were there. I think my wife had to do that when she was there too. So like, you know, do you think it's better? Do you, is this stuff like shocking and surprising to you? Or is this kind of like part of your understanding of the terrain that leads to our laws? Have we finally broken the shackles of like the legal formalism that was, was such a big part of, I guess, my legal education, I suspect that like all lawyers before me. No, I mean, Maybe I again. I don't know what your. I don't know what did you take. It wasn't leg reg. It was what was it? It was legislation and admin law. Two classes. Okay, <laughs> and, and they so, were both unpopular. <laughs> but I, I went through them anyway. I mean, look. I first of all, leg reg was not really my subject area. It's, <laughs> <laughs> but I I will say that you know I, I don't have the experience of knowing what it was like when you took it. I, I will say, though, I, I think that there still is, and maybe in some of the, you know, I wasn't like you, Scott, I, I didn't take as many black letter law classes as I should have as I went into 2L and 3L. I basically- You took Ben you know, Wittes seminars. And yeah, I took Ben Wittes' <laughs> seminar and I took uh, a bunch of clinical coursework. So I just, which- you know, allows you to learn black letter law through practice. But um, I kind of just uh, did not re I, like I never took admin, uh, which is something that people take later on. Uh, so I don't know, you know, maybe if those classes are a bit different. But I I think that the description that you gave is still pretty much the same when when people take leg reg, you know, you're not really talking about the realities of what Congress is actually doing when they're legislating and the kind of politics of it all. You're you're kind of looking 
at things at a very, you know, surface level and applying these, you know, canons of construction and doing statutory interpretation in a way that feels very removed from the reality of politics. And so if that is what you're saying your experience was like, my experience was was still very similar uh, when I when I took leg reg. But it is a good point that, you know, it's it, within legal education, there's just this kind of gap between the reality and then, you know, how lawyers are being trained to look at statutes and, and to think about legislation. And can I just yeah. add one thing, which I think is like pretty um, as much as I like to um, gently mock the lawyers I interact with on a regular basis about their um, understanding of Congress. Um, I actually think if we think about the current, the pending case before the Supreme Court, that's a direct challenge to Chevron, that this is actually a big um, issue, like a, a genuine issue. Yeah. Um, this is about, exactly what I was going to tee up for my next question. About like going forward, that if the court does either basically gut entirely or significantly um, cabin uh, Chevron deference, then we're like left in this world where both people will need to understand more about how Congress actually does its work. And Congress will need like more resources and more expertise to actually figure out how to legislate in a post-Chevron world. I would also like to add that I did take leg reg during the pandemic when we <laughs> things went online. No so excuses, Anna. <laughs> my experience of learning leg reg was probably very different <laughs> from anyone else's because it was, you know, right when the pandemic hit and things were <laughs> things were very <laughs> challenging for both students and professors. So shout out to Jody Freeman, who was a great professor. <laughs> Um. <laughs> no, 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 no offense taken, Professor Freeman. I have no doubt you did your good work uh, on Anna here. And I will say there are some law professors who've done really cool scholarship around some of this stuff. I'll, uh, Abby Gluck has done stuff for a long time. I think I think of an article she wrote like 10 years ago about breaking down how empirically how wrong most of our Kansas statutory interpretation are. Jesse Cross, a classmate of mine, does really interesting stuff at, at USC. He was at USC. I don't know if he's still there now. But uh, so there's cool stuff happening in, in academia. We'll see when it transfers into uh, actual legal uh, teaching or pedagogy. Before we break from this topic, Molly, I want to come back to you on, on one more thing, um, which is kind of like looking forward a little bit, right? So like these dynamics are changing. And they seem, you tell me if I'm wrong about this, but they seem to like fundamentally be changing for exogenous political reasons that don't seem likely to like break in a major way. I could be wrong about that, but like you essentially have, particularly in the House, a contingent within the Republican Party that like has a strong incentive to be obstructionists. And they are driven there by an ideological factor, but ideological reinforced by politics and political incentives. And it's not clear to me how you break out of that, really. Um, you know, maybe the Republicans lose more, and so they have an incentive to like bring in more moderate people. But you know, a lot of these people aren't seem very motivated by like their elections and their congressional districts, and might not be swayed as evidenced by the lack of party discipline by the needs of the broader party. So, I, I guess my question is like. What do you do if you're a leader of this party? Like, what does Mike Johnson do? We we heard this interesting pitch that got floated. I don't know if it was real or not. It was real purported. Um, I didn't dig into it enough as much as I should have uh, about like Democrats, you know, kind of putting a lifeline out to Mike Johnson as a way to try and move some of this legislation forward, saying like, we'll back your speakership essentially to some extent. Is that realistic? A at this stage, that was something that we like very that seems very intuitively sensible to me on a very bland. Here's like the the nuts and bolts billiard ball of the institution and and how their interests seem to lie, but it was very poo pooed I think correctly and like was seen as just totally implausible given political dynamics and culture in the house in particular during the Kevin McCarthy incident. But do those become more realistic as you you just run out of other solutions? Those unlikely but still possible institutional connections. Like where does it go from here? What is the trajectory? Yeah, they're both great questions. Um, on sort of like much bigger picture about the um, future of um, of Congress. And here, I think we're mainly talking about sort of the future of the Congressional Republican Party, um, because that's the place where you have this large and growing faction whose sort of goal in Congress um, seems to be to shout about things as opposed to do things. And the incentives are self-reinforcing. So as people who might be looking at running for Congress in an open seat 
say, oh, is this the right job for me? And they look around at the people who seem to be successful in the job. And they're all the people who are doing the shouting and not the people who are doing the legislating. That leads a certain kind of person to think that a career in Congress is right for them. Um, And I have... I don't have great solutions or thoughts about what fixes that part of the problem, but it's a it is a big um, incentive um, problem for um, for members. And I think the degree to which we see some of this creeping from the House into the Senate is a um, not a great sign from my perspective. In terms of the like most proximate question about Mike Johnson, you're right that we have seen some a couple of House Democrats, um, named and unnamed, say that you know if Mike Johnson brought immigration and um, Ukraine deal to the floor, and he was faced with an attempt to overthrow him as a result. Maybe some Democrats would be willing to um, to prop him up, which is not what happened um, with Kevin McCarthy. Um, I don't necess- I don't think that that's likely. Um, I mean, I think it's unlikely mainly because I don't really think Republicans have the appetite to go through, I think I said this last week, to go through the experience that they went through in the three weeks after McCarthy got overthrown. Um, I don't think they want to go there again, particularly because they ran through the list, much of the list of plausible McCarthy successors before they ended up with Mike Johnson. And so if it's not Mike Johnson, then who is it going to be? But I, I think that the fact that we're still having this conversation about, you know, would they be willing to get rid of another speaker um, over what are ultimately unrealistic asks in divided government? Uh, and this is probably a good place to end this part on, which is just a reminder that the world that we are all living in is one where Republicans control barely <laughs> one chamber of Congress. Um, the other chamber is controlled by Democrats, and there's a Democratic president in the White House. And unless and until Republicans win more elections and win uh, larger majorities and have a Republican president in the White House, there is only so much that they can do. And I think that they think for some of these members, the the goal is actually just to be angry about things. There's a back in the fall, in November, I think, um, I had a piece in the New York Times that one of the things that it did was make this argument is that there's some element of the House Republican Conference in particular, whose sort of entire MO is just to be mad about stuff. And if your goal is to be mad about stuff, sowing dysfunction is actually in service of that goal. um, And that leaves us all worse off because we have these big problems that Congress should be trying to solve. But our political system is sort of reinforcing those incentives at this point. Well, from torrid affairs of state to just some torrid affairs, let us now turn to events in Fulton County. Molly, I'm going to hand over to you to get us started on this next topic. I just Um, really wanted to get that segue off my chest. (laughs) It's a good segue. Um, And I am going to turn to Anna here. And I'm going to start by just saying that, Anna, um, the other day you told the rest of us that you had, and I think this is a direct quote, read the divorce documents, which I'm guessing is not a sentence that you ever thought you'd say when you started covering the Trump trials (laughs) for uh, lawfare. Um, And it's a reference, um, as Scott said at the opening, to the fact that Fonnie Willis, the Georgia district attorney, um, is facing allegations of being romantically involved with Nathan Wade, the special prosecutor hired by her office to manage the complex prosecution of uh, former President Trump and various co-conspirators for their conduct surrounding the 2020 election. So um, maybe just to start... Can you talk us through a little bit about how these allegations against Willis fit in with the broader prosecution against Trump? Like, why are we talking about documents in Nathan Wade's divorce case in the first place? Yeah, and I I will say, Molly, on the first part of, of your intro there, I was in Cobb County Superior Court for a divorce hearing on Monday, and I was standing around in the clerk's office afterward trying to get these divorce documents that were just unsealed. And I looked at another reporter and I was like, did you ever think five months ago that we'd be in divorce court as a part of covering the prosecution of Donald Trump in Fulton County, Georgia? Um, I so it, <laughs> I can only imagine what like other people who were in divorce court to finalize their own divorces are like. Why are there all these reporters <laughs> here? Like this is I'm just here to transact what might be one of the worst days of my life, um, and here it's like a million reporters doing something else. <laughs> yeah, it was. 
It was just a bizarre experience and a, and a, and a turn in this case that I didn't expect um, at all. But uh, to answer your question about some of the background, I think it's helpful a little bit to kind of give some context here. So it, it, there are these allegations that were raised by one of Trump's co-defendants, Mike Roman. Um, but before we get to that, you know, the allegation is that Fawny Willis is engaged in an improper romantic relationship and that she received financial benefits as a result of that relationship with special prosecutor Nathan Wade. Uh, Nathan Wade is a man who was one of the special prosecutors that Willis hired to work on the Trump case. Uh, He wasn't actually technically hired just to work on the Trump case. He was kind of hired as this leader of the anti-corruption unit in Fulton County, which is the unit that ended up taking on the Trump case and has basically only worked on that case uh, because it is such a sprawling case and it involved 19 co-defendants originally. The investigation part of that case lasted for, you know, more more than a year. Uh, There was the special grand jury. During all of that, Nathan Wade, who was hired in November of 2021, was kind of the, you know, managerial figure. He very rarely appears in court to argue. He he kind of typically appears alongside his deputies and uh, Donald Wakeford, who tend to be the ones who argue in court and and Um, argue at motions hearings. So Nathan Wade has had a little bit more of a behind the scenes role, but he's been a big part of the case in managing, you know, the special grand jury investigation. Uh, He seems to be of the three special prosecutors that Fawny Willis hired. He seems to be you know, the one who has been the most directly involved in every aspect of the proceedings and the investigation and and the indictment. The other two people that were hired, uh, there's a woman named Anna Cross. She was hired because she has a lot of background in, in federal practice and federal, you know, defense and prosecutions. And I think that knowing that there was going to maybe be a a federal practice element of all this with the removal proceedings, of course, there are four defendants who are still seeking to remove the case to federal court. Anna Cross was brought in and and worked on a lot of the removal proceeding aspects. And then there's John Floyd, who is a man who is known as the state's, you know, foremost RICO expert. Uh, He's nationally recognized as a RICO expert as well. Uh, He has worked with Fonnie Willis before on some of the RICO cases that that she has, has brought against various people. And so he was brought on to also work on the case. So you have these three special prosecutors, Nathan Wade being the one who kind of is the most involved. And it has now been alleged that Fonnie Willis is in a romantic relationship with Nathan Wade and that this relationship began before he was appointed as special prosecutor in 2021. I should also say that for those who are used to us talking about special counsels in the federal context, in Georgia, the special prosecutor role is very different from a special counsel in federal practice. It's the, it's not something that requires, you know, independence from the main prosecuting figure. So, for example, special counsel Jack Smith appointed by Mer- Merrick Garland, and there's kind of a separation or independent element to the prosecution that Jack Smith is carrying out. Merrick Garland isn't supposed to be really involved in the decisions that Jack Smith is making and that kind of thing. That's very different from what's going on here. A special prosecutor in Georgia is someone who is brought in as like a contract attorney. So they're not a salaried staff member, but they're usually brought on and paid an hourly rate, um, typically because maybe the there's a specialty area that the district attorney needs a special prosecutor for, um, and they have kind of relevant experience. So, for example, Anna Cross and John Floyd are two really good examples of that because of their kind of specialty areas in federal practice and then in RICO prosecutions. Or, you know, it's it's maybe the case that you want to bring on a special prosecutor because 
you, your office just doesn't have the capacity with the current um, salaried staff members that you have. And so because of the, the rules around, you know, caps on certain salaried staff members, you have to bring in a contract attorney. So that's the difference. So all of this came about and, and was alleged in a motion by Mike Roman, who's one of Trump's co-defendants in the RICO case. The day that motions for uh, pretrial motions were due around, you know, 530, this motion hits the docket it is a motion to disqualify Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade and to dismiss the charges against Mike Roman. And in the motion, Mike Roman makes the argument that, you know, there is this improper romantic relationship that Fonnie Willis hired Nathan Wade, who it's alleged that he was not qualified to, you know, be appointed a special prosecutor. It is alleged that he's paid, uh, you know, a fee that is quite high relative to other special prosecutors or other contract attorneys in Fulton County. And but the kind of real like legal argument here is that uh, because of this romantic relationship, you know, Fonnie Willis has gone on trips with him that he has paid for and and kind of, you know, so-called lavish vacations, and that that is basically, in effect, a, a kickback of sorts, you know, that he's being paid by the county, and then they're going on these vacations that he's paying for, and so then she's receiving this, you know, indirect financial benefit that, in effect, would give her a, a kind of, you know, a pecuniary interest in prolonging the case uh, or expanding the case. And Mike Roman says that as a result, under Georgia law, that means that Fonnie Willis should be disqualified. So I think that that kind of sums up how it fits into the larger prosecution. And I'm happy to talk a little bit, a little bit more about the law if you guys want to. But yeah, so my sort of I think you teed up my next question, which is um, basically, I can think of like three ways in which this is a problem. So one is that it is just, I have air quotes going there, sort of an optics problem um, or or just a sort of problem in terms of um, Willis's like political capital in all of this. The second is that it's that and also a sort of personal legal problem for Willis. And then the third is that it's an optics problem, a personal legal problem for Willis, and also um, somehow sort of threatens the actual investigation and the set of charges that Willis' office has brought against Trump and his various and sundry co-defendants. Um, kind of, how would you characterize the problem? And or tell me if that's the wrong way to think about it. Well, and let me kind of layer one, one more aspect on top of that, too, is is particularly that third bucket, this question about what the legal consequences of this are, they really seem to hinge on what the prosecutor's office, what Georgia or what Fulton County, like whatever the relevant authority is, depending on what layer it kind of happens at, like what their standard is for disclosure of financial interest, right? Like I've done financial interest disclosure forms. I actually suspect that when I was single, I don't know if I did them when I was single. I probably might have when I started in government. If I did, I'm not sure I would have had to disclose like my girlfriend's employment or somebody with whom I had like a not legally binding relationship or that their economic interest would have actually communicated back to me. And so like that always struck me as a little bit of a strange aspect of this. Like maybe it would be one thing if she and Wade had like a one agreement saying, oh yeah, 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 you're going to get this much more money out of this and quid pro quo you're going to take me to Aruba or wherever on this trip. But it's really different to say like, oh, we are dating. We have this relationship. Money is spent on different shared purposes. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I have like a disclosure obligation or a clear conflict of interest in, in other conflict of interest seems that I have encountered before. I don't think. At least not. it's not like black and white to me. Do we have a sense about like where the line is for Georgia, for F Fulton County? Yeah, I mean, look, people that I've talked to about this and and the reports that I've read all seem to suggest that there's there's not really like a disclosure requirement that that applies to this situation under the county kind of, you know, 
ethics regulations. I'm still working on trying to figure out if there is any, you know, local ordinance rules or ethics rules that that seem to directly apply. Uh, so I I don't want to make a, a statement about that until I'm I'm certain. But as far as I can tell right now, there doesn't seem to be anything that I have found that that really seems to indicate that this is something that would have required disclosure. I will say, though, that in terms of the legal standard, and because that is related to, you know, the the question of just generally, you know, good governance and, you know, the procurement rules around Wade's hiring and that kind of thing, right? Whereas there's the the separate issue that I think people are tend to confuse is just, you know, these more general kind of issues around was this unethical and, and does it raise questions about whether Fonnie Willis broke some rules that apply just generally in terms of the the position of her office and and hiring rules or ethics rules. And then is there a conflict of interest that is disqualifying as it relates to the Trump prosecution? Uh, so under Georgia law, the kind of the the standard that has been developed is whether there the district attorney has a personal stake in the defendant's conviction. So that could be you know, something that is pecuniary, a pecuniary or personal stake, you know, some examples, and it has to be an actual conflict. It's not typically, you know, just the appearance of propriety that matters. You know, it has to be something that is more than just a speculative conflict or something that's a little bit more remote as it relates to the prosecution of the particular individual here being Mike Roman. And the, uh, you know, examples of some of this, for for example, would be a prosecutor who has a specific relationship with uh, a victim, although there are, there are circumstances in which prosecutors, for example, special prosecutors who are representing the family of a victim in a case in a civil suit have then been brought on to work on the prosecution, and that has found to be not disqualifying. There are other examples in which, for example, if a prosecutor is prosecuting someone who they previously represented as a defendant. So those are the kinds of things, or most relevant here maybe would be Georgia courts have found that prosecutors, special prosecutors who are hired to work on a contingency fee for the the seizure of assets would would basically you know that is a conflict of interest because it gives them an incentive to you know the more assets that are seized then then the the higher their rate is and Georgia court said that's disqualifying because it's contrary to public policy to pay prosecutors based on a contingency fee so those are some examples on, of where Georgia courts have found that there is a conflict. In the context of this case, we've actually seen a disqualification motion succeed previously. Uh, Fonnie Willis was disqualified from investigating Burt Jones, who is the l- lieutenant governor of Georgia. And uh, Fonnie Willis held a fundraiser for his then political opponent in his lieutenant governor race. And and Judge McBurney found that that was a conflict that would be disqualifying because the investigation against Burt Jones w- would be something that would tend to you know detract from his political uh, race and 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 so Judge McBurney said, "Fonnie Willis, you can't investigate Burt Jones." So that is the standard. As, as far as whether or not Fonnie Willis will be disqualified under that standard, I mean, I do not have reason to think right now, based on what we've seen, that, that she would be. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it's really hard to disqualify prosecutors. It's very rarely successful. And I haven't seen anything that shows, you know, that there is something, like you said, Scott, that this is a situation where, for example, there would be an agreement that, okay, um, you know, you're going to give me these kickbacks 
if you, you know, choose to prosecute all of these different people, it seems like that's a very different situation from what we have here where we've seen that, you know, based on credit card statements, it seems like they took some trips together, but in their potentially in their personal capacities or potentially because of a possible romantic relationship. But I haven't seen anything that really raises the question of whether this kind of, you know, these trips or this relationship would give Fonnie Willis a stake in the conviction of Mike Roman. Uh, it seems like a more kind of generalized issue that that might cause problems for her, you know, politically. That's one of the buckets that you mentioned, Molly, that I think is the most significant here because it really feels like a turning point in the narrative around the case, in the political capital that Fonnie Willis has, because it really does seem like, you know, whether or not this is disqualifying as it relates to the Trump prosecution, I think there are some, you know, there is some real criticism and questions that are raised when it comes to the ethics and the propriety of hiring a romantic partner to run this high profile prosecution. And, and also, you know, a romantic partner who, as far as I can tell, does not have relevant experience in a complex RICO prosecution or other pro- complex criminal prosecution. Uh, I have not been able to find any examples of Nathan Weed prosecuting uh, a felony case, although he has been a defense attorney in several felony cases. So, you know, I think that there are some real questions that are raised here. At the very least, it seems to su- suggest some poor judgment on the part of Fonnie Willis. But I am, uh, based on the state of the facts that we have now, which again, that might change, I'm a little bit doubtful that it will end up being disqualifying. But it's it's certainly not, you know, a frivolous argument in my view. But speaking of public officials receiving or as it relates to our next topic, seizing uh, pecuniary gains, the United States has recently shifted its policy position in favor of proposals to seize frozen Russian assets and provide them to Ukraine as compensation for Russia's unlawful invasion of Ukraine. The topic is reportedly on the agenda of the upcoming Group of Seven meeting. And as we record this episode on Wednesday, January 24th, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is scheduled to mark up its version of a bill that would authorize the president to seize Russian assets and provide them to Ukraine. Scott, you've previously written on this subject, uh, and you have a new piece out in Lawfare called Some Tips for Congress on How to Seize Russian Assets. So tell us to start, what's the significance of all of this, uh, especially as it relates to the broader context of U.S. policy and international law? Sure. I mean, what we've seen, I think, in the last month or two is a shift in tide towards this particular outcome, towards the possibility of seizing Russian assets, which has been a two-year conversation. Really, as soon as the United States and Western allies froze huge swaths of Russia's uh, and Belarus's to some extent, but primarily Russia's foreign reserves, about $300 billion or so worldwide, the vast majority of which belong to Russia's central bank, they have been essentially frozen in place as the war against Ukraine has gone forward. Meanwhile, Ukraine has been the victim of what no one really seriously doubts is extremely unlawful uh, and brutal aggression by Russia that's inflicted massive damage on them to the point that they have a, something like an ex- estimated $400 billion reconstruction bill, probably even higher if you work in the cost of actually continuing to defend themselves against what is an ongoing conflict at present. The issue never really came to a head um, when Western powers were, were pumping a ton of foreign assistance and security assistance into Ukraine. Um, and that is still considering continuing to some degree. But as the political dynamics around direct bilateral foreign assistance, um, particularly in the United States, but in other countries as well, has gotten more tight. Uh, you know, we just spent our first segment talking about um, the challenges facing Ukraine assistance supplemental in Congress currently. You've seen growing interest in this idea that, like, well, maybe we can use these frozen Russian assets and to provide them to Ukraine um, as compensation for the damage it suffered. The moral logic is very compelling. But as I wrote in a piece with Shemen Keitner, one of our contributing editors uh, and a former counselor uh, in international law at the State Department, 
we wrote a piece way back in May 2022, kind of laying out how, how this is actually not that easily easy to do legally um, for a variety of reasons, both domestic and international. Um, at the time, there was this big argument that some people were making that this could be done under existing statutory authorities. That's that's really a hard argument to make. Um, it runs very contrary to how those authorities have been interpreted by the courts, by the executive branch, by uh, to the legislative history of those ex of, of those measures. And then we have you know this idea of well, con Congress authorized legislation to do this. It's something that they haven't really done before. We only have two really limited incidents of Congress uh, legislating um, the seizure of foreign assets during peacetime, of foreign state assets, I should say. There's a long tradition of seizing foreign assets, including foreign state and foreign national assets during wartime. That's very well established, but there's always been this sharp binary. And Congress has really pushed them, only pushed the envelope twice. Neither one was for a huge sum or for like a, a large scale item, and neither one was challenged in the court. So there's no case law from the court saying, like, here's how we think about this domestic seizure ability. And it's all laid out against, of course, like a backdrop of constitutional rights and particularly the takings clause, um, which says usually when the government takes property, you're supposed to compensate somebody. Okay, well, then. The wartime exception is an express, express exception the Supreme Court has found that that doesn't apply during wartime and war to, to wartime seizures. But then if you're going to do it during peacetime, how do you justify that? You've got to find some other reason why um, that doesn't apply here. The Justice Department, in when they considered doing this but never actually pursued it in 1980, they argued essentially the takings clause doesn't apply to foreign governments. And so it doesn't really matter here because it only applies to private property. But that narrow reading of private property isn't the one the Supreme Court has applied subsequent to that in other contexts. And notably, like lower courts, while some of the lower courts have said that foreign state governments don't have due process rights, um, they have said state owned entities of foreign governments have due process rights, as long as they're like not an alter ego of the state. And that can be include foreign central banks, foreign wealth funds, all the sorts of things whose assets could be targeted by this. So, so it's a convoluted question. Um, I ultimately think there's a good case Congress can do this, um, but it's a kind of untrodden legal territory. And there's a lot of places things could get caught up kind of all on the way that I think we need to be honest about and Congress needs to be honest about and aware about as they're, as they're plotting out how to best go about this. And that's before you even get to the international side of this, which is the most important. Of the $300 billion that Russia is estimated to have that are frozen around the world, only about $5 billion people think is in the United States. It's a big sum of money, but it's kind of a drop in the bucket compared to what both what Ukraine needs and what assistance it's gotten from a variety of countries is kind of continually getting. Uh, although again, that number is like rapidly diminishing. So the question then becomes like, how can the United States persuade European allies, and particularly Belgium of all countries, where most of these assets are actually held, the jurisdiction which they're held, to go along with an effort to use these assets to provide compensation to Ukraine? That's the bigger question with that's going to be discussed at the G7. It involves very complicated questions about how you think about international law and probably a need to like what's called progressively develop how we think about international law, basically to budge the rules in a way that we can build consensus around. Um, because traditionally, States like the United States, powerful states, have, have often actually argued against international law allowing self-help um, to just secure reparations and compensation for internationally long, wrongful acts, particularly from foreign state assets. So this would be a big gap in that regime, and it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. And underlying all of this is the is the concern that like this is going to be one more measure, like the sanctions themselves, freezing these assets, that's going to scare all sorts of foreign governments away from the U.S. economy, U.S. financial system, and the Western financial system altogether. Having the fact that the United States is a premier destination for foreign government assets for them to hold their foreign reserves, hugely beneficial to our economy, is the reason our sanctions, our bilateral sanctions, are effective as they are. And if that were to be diminished, it would clearly hurt U.S. interests, economic and otherwise, you know, indefinitely, essentially, because that probably is, is is a status that would not be coming back. Now, it's it's probably not realistic to assume that like this is going to be a, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back in that regard, and that's going to send people fleeing. But I think it's also too optimistic to say that there's no chance that this has any impact, that the truth is probably a great degree of uncertainty along the margin and depends a lot upon how Congress goes about doing this, along with the executive branch and the Biden administration that's that's now on board with some version of this, although very much emphasizing the multilateral aspect of it. So that's really the question that Congress is is wrestling with now uh, and that the executive branch will be wrestling with in the weeks to come as they lead up to that G7 meeting. So, Scott, can I ask a sort of follow-up question to that, um, that Hart refers back to what we talked about at the top, which is, so if you think, as I do, that there is only so much sort of political capital within Congress for aggressive legislative action to aid the Ukrainians, like, and you made the point that at least that 
in dollar terms, there's actually not that much Russian money that like the U.S. could seize um, in uh, U.S. financial institutions. Is this, to your mind, like where they should be spending the political capital? Like, how does this sort of fit into the broader legislative picture of the U.S. trying to provide support for what um, Ukraine is um, is doing? So it's a really hard question. And, and frankly, I think this is like, it's, it's a good one that reflects why a lot of people, including me, had reservations about really going gung-ho this were out, particularly earlier in this conflict several years ago. Because this talking point that there is this Russian money out there is not infrequently deployed as an argument to say, well, like, we should just use that and stop spending our own money or lean on that first. And then we can talk about doing US foreign assistance. It's, it's, a, it's a substitute for foreign assistance. But that's not, of course, what this money is supposed to be. Uh, Ukraine is, is owed reparations. like It has suffered damages. Um, uh, it is entitled to that money. The mechanism by which it gets it isn't clear. Um, but it, no, very few people disagree that it's entitled to it if not all that money, a substantial part of it, if and when you know the international claims actually kind of come to fruition, um, and you and you get some sort of settlement, the the question then becomes well, well, how you know it's not particularly fair to say, well, we're going to expedite this, but only so that we can stop paying you the assistance that we think you need anyway. It becomes begins to be used to subsidize U- Ukraine's allies as opposed to actually assisting Ukraine because the net sum to them gets kind of accounted out. That was really dangerous. I think a, a real concern for a while. And I think a reason why, frankly, the Biden administration was very reluctant to kind of go whole, whole hog on the situation, in addition to that kind of risk of scaring people out of the US economy, the de-dollarization risk, as it's called. I think at this point, they are more willing to entertain it, both because it's probably perceived as being somewhat less harmful in that regard, because the dynamics around future assistance are already so complicated, and also because I, I think it is tied up in these negotiations uh, over the supplemental somewhat indirectly. But I think a lot of legislators in on Capitol Hill have kind of said, we need to see action on the Repo Act. It's, it is co-sponsored on the Senate side by uh, Senator Risch, who's kind of the ranking minority member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Um, so he feels very strongly about it, has been really pushing for a- action on it. And I think they see progress on it as potentially being a, a a car they can play to try and say, hey, work with us, particularly Senate Republicans who are more vested in this, although House Republicans, Mike McCall, uh, House Foreign Affairs Committee chairman, is, is pretty invested as well and, and co-sponsors the House parallel bill. We'll work with you on this bill. We're not going to pretend like it's going to wash out all these other requests, particularly if it only ends up in being a $5 million billion amount, which again, a lot of money, but, but not compared to like the overall assistance that Ukraine needs. So I, I think the political dynamics around that have changed. And I think that's a big reason why you see the change in the administration's administration's posture on this. The administration is supportive of this. I, I don't know if I would describe them as like, they don't seem like they're super gung-ho for it. Um, although there's some arguments are saying that they're they're eager. I, you know, my sense is, is that the focus is much more on the multilateral element. Um, they've really, most of the statements we've seen, which have been pretty quiet so far, again, they've been kind of slowly and quietly rolling this position out over the last few months, which evidently they've had since November. Has been, hey, you know, we are working with foreign allies to do this, and we will need authority to do it. And if Congress wants to give us that authority, that's great. A big debate over what's happening today is over whether there should be some sort of certification or other requirement built into the law to say the president needs to certify that they have the G7 on board before using this authority. Um, some people say, no, that's a waste of time. You should keep flexibility. There's a argument that is unconstitutional floating around, which I don't think really carries water, but it's out there and being voiced by some prominent people. Uh, and then there is an argument on the flip side saying like, well, look, you can come back and strip this requirement later if you feel like it's worth going unilaterally, but maybe it's worth Congress putting its foot down saying, we want this to be multilateral and we're 100% behind efforts to make it multilateral. Maybe that will help international negotiations. And the Biden administration has suggested they think it will uh, and has voiced kind of like support for that certification, but although I think support for the legislation even without it as well. So the long and short of it is is the dynamics are, are kind of strange, but a lot of it is really, this is a prelude to the much bigger conversation, which is the international conversation. And that is the potentially really pivotal one. If you can find a way to free up those funds or use them for in a different way that would be provided to Ukraine, that would be a, a big step in the direction of rebuilding a major chunk of what could be used for various purposes that would otherwise be filled by foreign assistance that currently is on the decline. Um, although, again, I doubt it will ever be the full $300 billion. I'm not sure you're going to get such full cooperation or that all those assets can be freed up. 
but uh, you know, getting there is going to be a heavy lift. Um, and there are competing counter equities that people need to take into account, which is kind of the subject of my piece, where I argue basically Congress needs to be narrow and focus about this and appreciate those counter equities to try and focus on seizing Russia with as narrow authority as possible and trying to level set everything else, maintain the status quo for the rest of the legal regime. Don't imply you're start, starting to seize other assets or this is the beginning of a, a new trend in US policy, because those sorts of things are going to make allies nervous and they're going to make foreign governments that do business in the United States nervous. You know, Molly, I'm, I'm kind of curious about this. This is an interesting bill and something we see not infrequently in the national security and foreign affairs space, where you, you occasionally see these very prominent bills um, that have unique support and that they get chairman on board, essentially, or ranking members. They've got very, very senior party leadership and committee leadership support across across the sort of chambers. Although it's a little different here now, right? Because like you have Mike McCall, who is a much more conventional conservative, like he is a more interventionist conservative in a lot of ways, I mean, most ways, uh, than a big wing of the Republican Party now. Senator Risch is kind of an outlier in a lot of different ways. Uh, Senator, you know, Senator Squirker was a little more in the more Mike McCall lane. I think Senator Risch is, is a little bit an outlier, but in a kind of similar vein. I don't think anybody thinks he's like a conventional Tea Partier on the foreign policy sort of set of issues. Uh, and so I, I guess my question is like, they they seem to be driving a ball about this. What is the source of authority for these chairman and ranking members, particularly when it's not 100% clear that like they can speak for their party as a whole on these sorts of things? Although it's worth noting on this issue, maybe they can. I, don't, I think even more restraint-oriented parts of the Republican Party have voiced kind of openness to seizing these assets, often as kind of like an alternative to providing more assistance. Yeah, and that's part of like why I asked the question that I just posed to you um, about, and sort of at its heart was this was wondering if part of what's going on here is that um, that for some folks um, who are supportive of this legislation, it's seen as just another tool in the toolbox of ensuring sort of U.S. and multilateral support for the Ukrainians, and then for other members, there are they sort of see this as a substitute for um, additional U.S. Um, uh, assistance. I believe this morning the Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, approved the legislation with sort of broad bipartisan support. I don't think it was quite unanimous, but I do it. I think it's an illustration of a dynamic that we've seen for a long time in foreign policy in Congress, which is the existence of kind of a broad bipartisan consensus around certain understanding of the U.S.'s role in the world that looks more unusual to us now because so many other areas where there had ever been bipartisan consensus has started to fall away. And so in some ways, like why this is, seems like an outlier is because the other places where we used to see this kind of cooperation um, are fewer and farther between, though, again, not unheard of in other policy areas either. So the other sort of the biggest Congress story um, that's not national security related right now is the existence of this bipartisan tax deal in the House um, that would pair an expansion of the child tax credit with sort of tax breaks for businesses, very classic log roll um, in Congress. And that also seems remarkable to us because it happens um, less frequently than it, than it used to. And so I think, I think the answer to your question, Scott, is that this seems unusual um, because it's one of the last holdouts of some of this this kind of bipartisan cooperation that we used to see in other areas as well. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of our conversation for this week. But this would not be rational security if we did not leave you with some object lessons to ponder over in the week to come. Molly, what do you have for us this week? So I have a book recommendation. Uh, if you are uh, a David Graham fan, you this book will not be new to you. Um, but uh, his most recent book is called The Wager. Um, so folks may be familiar with David Graham um, as the author of Killers of the Flower Moon, um, a book whose movie adaptation was nominated for several Oscars this week. Um, but The Wager, uh, which is his most recent book, is a book about um, a British military vessel that runs aground on the coast of South America, and then what happens after that. Um, about a third of the way through it, it is a remarkably detailed piece of storytelling. Um, I will caution listeners that if you have the same reading habits as I do, which is that you read primarily just before going to sleep. This is not the best book for that time of the day because there's a there's a lot of 
lot of starvation, a lot of death. Um, but um, it is just a remarkable piece of storytelling. Um, and so I recommend it to all of you. And I believe it too is being adapted into a film by Martin Scorsese. So you can get ready for that as one of my object lessons in the future. Well, for my object lesson this week, I will uh, share a story. One of my favorite things happened to me, not once, uh, but twice, even kind of three times, depending on how you count it in the last few days, which is that I've had a rational security or lawfare listener or reader (laughs) come up and talk to me in the wild. It used to happen more often when I got out more. It doesn't happen as often as it used to, but I, in the one day in the last week and a half where I've not been either snowed in or home with a sick child, uh, I went to go try and watch a football game at a brewery with my family. Uh, and found myself awkwardly lingering around the margins of a birthday party that had this TV on, the only TV on the game. And it turns out the birthday boy listens and watches, listens to the podcast, watches and reads Lawfare, uh, and let me not only watch the game, but uh, offered me cake, which is very nice. Although I declined because I'm trying to eat healthy these days. Um, but regardless, I want to wish a very happy birthday to Paul. Uh, thank you for your generosity in sharing your screen and your cake. And just put out a general call out there. Hey, if you're out there in the wild and you see me, or I will say anybody of my, of my co-hosts, maybe Quinta or Alan will hold that against me one day, or Molly and Anna, I'll, leave, I'll let you speak for yourself, but come and say hi. It's great to meet people. It's always nice. Positive reinforcement is rare in this world. You don't get it on Twitter. You don't get a lot of other places. It's nice to get it in person. Uh, so uh, by all means, come over and say hi. It always makes my day. And thank you, Paul, for making my day this weekend. Anna, what do you have for us to bring us home? Yeah, well, happy birthday, Paul. I should say that I think this is the same guy who also ran into Ben Wittes I think that's right. when I was going to meet Ben for brunch. And so I just missed Paul. Uh, so I'm sorry I missed you, Paul, but happy birthday. Okay, so my object lesson, I don't even know if this counts as an object lesson, but I just have some words of praise for the Cobb County Superior Court Clerk's office. <laughs> Because I was I was there the other day, as I said, for, for this divorce court hearing. And then, you know, afterward they unsealed the uh divorce records of Nathan Wade, who is in the middle of of a of the process of divorcing his his estranged wife. Uh, and that has all become a part of the, you know, ongoing Fulton County allegations uh, brought by Mike Roman because, because it was argued that, you know, there might be some evidence of this relationship in the divorce records. Uh, so I, after the hearing, I went down to the clerk's office to try to get access to some of the documents that were unsealed because many of them were not available online. They, they kind of, you have to go in person and kind of like a library situation where you have to go to the terminal to to view the documents. And clerk's offices are very busy, which is understandable as to why many clerk's offices are entirely unhelpful when you're trying to, you know, get some documents. I've, I've worked with a lot of uh, clerks in different state courts, and it's not always the most pleasant uh, situation. Uh, but the Cobb County Superior Court clerks were incredibly nice. Um, they they helped the journalists who were swarming their uh, office to to get some of these documents. Um, and it was it was just they made it a really pleasant process, uh, which is like I said, unusual when you're trying to get documents. So if you have to get divorced in Georgia, and if you can do it in Cobb County, my object lesson would be. Do it with the, at the place with the best clerks, which is the Cobb County Superior Court. So that's my. It's so weird that that's the, the city motto: is if you have to get divorced, do it in Cobb County. <laughs> Exactly. And, and and have a salad while you're here. That's my that's object a, lesson. You I know. like it. <laughs> All right. Well, you know, good to know. <laughs> you never know. It's going to come in handy. <laughs> Hopefully not soon. Well, folks, that brings us to the end of this week's episode. Rational Security is, of course, a production of Lawfare. So be sure to visit us at lawfaremedia.org for our show page, for links to past episodes, for our written work and the written work of other Lawfare contributors, and for information on Lawfare's other podcast series, including The Aftermath, season two of which is out now. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at RTL Security, and be sure to leave a rating or review wherever you might be listening. While you're at it, sign up to become a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon for an ad-free version of this podcast and other special benefits. Visit lawfaremedia.org slash support for more details. Our audio engineer and producer this week was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo, and our music, as always, was performed by Sophia Yan. And we are once again edited by the wonderful Jen Pacha Howell. On behalf of my special guests, not co-hosts, Molly and Anna, 
I am Scott R. Anderson. We'll talk to you next week. Until then, goodbye.